hello back everybody. Now, potentially with a cup of coffee in your hand, um, it is my great honor to be chairing this panel number two on creating an enabling environment for human rights defenders, for NHRIs and other human rights defenders when monitoring, promoting and protecting human rights at the borders. Uh, the, the objective of this panel now is to discuss the current environment at borders for the work of human rights defenders. So as I said, in not only NHRIs, but also civil society organizations, humanitarian associations, and to hear from uh, um, all our partners uh, what their views are. Um, just to present myself very quickly, I am the new Ombudswoman of Croatia, uh, the institution which is a, a, a classic uh, Ombudsman type, type mandate institution, but also an A status NHRI, as well as a national preventive mechanism and equality body. So uh, uh, a couple of mandates there, which enables us to, to uh, approach this issue from, from a synergic point of view, um, and also is a member of the executive board of ENRI. Now, as I mentioned in this panel, we're going to discuss the environment uh, um, that human rights defenders currently face when doing their human rights uh, uh, work or humanitarian work. As uh, we all know, it has been reported and also by NHRI is that human rights defenders at work, particularly on the topic of migration, are subject to threats, smear campaigns, uh, funding cuts, uh, aggression, and even criminalization. Um, NHRIs, unfortunately, have not been spared from this practice of, of seeking to undermine uh, monitoring and protection of human rights at borders and monitoring and human rights accountability at borders, as we all know, is, is quite needed. And that really um, gets us started uh, um, with our, our speakers, uh, first of which will be a member of the European Parliament, uh, Tine Kestrik. Uh, once again, like in the first panel, each speaker will have 10 minutes. Uh, and after all the speakers are finished, we will open the floor for questions and interventions. And uh, colleagues at the ENRI Secretariat will be informing all the speakers when their time is up. So first, I would like to give the floor uh, to Tine Kestrik, uh, whom I'm sure we all know is one of the most active representatives um, at the parliament working in the field of migration, and who has been quite outspoken about the need to ensure that rule of law and human rights accountability is ensured at borders. Now, Tineke, the questions for you are, how do you see the current scenario at EU borders for independent human rights work? And do you see an interlink between the EU's work on the rule of law and the persisting violations and lack of accountability of migrants' rights at borders? But also, what can we expect in the future, having the proposals under the EU Pact in mind? Anything else you, you wish to accent, of course, feel free. And I give you the floor and you have 10 minutes. Thank you very much also for the invitation and for this uh, very relevant uh, uh, webinar that you've organized. I, I have took the question a little bit broader, but, but I will start with this specific question on, uh, on human rights defenders, because I think it's clear that uh, they are under threat in many countries, especially uh, in the border countries where human rights violations take place uh, at the borders. And um, you cannot see it separately indeed from the regression if it comes to rule of law, safeguards and the way civil society uh, is affected by that as well. And it, it's not really only Hungary where those things are taking place. Uh, and uh, I think it's for a reason that most of the people uh, choose uh, chose as an answer uh, that we need a more uh, fact-based communication by governments because it's very clear that where we see a repressive uh, policies uh, on migration, then uh, you also see that uh, governments are looking for scapegoats and uh, for for, um, for people to blame. And there you see a very clear uh, uh, relation between human rights defenders and uh, and uh, anti-immigration uh, rhetorics. And um, uh, I was, um, uh, we know of course about, for instance, the, the Greek uh, NGO uh, law that has uh, been introduced not so long ago. Uh, I visited uh, Samos and Athens uh, recently and uh, asking about the uh, effects. And there you clearly see a relation between this law 
and uh, uh, the, the problems that NGOs are faced with uh, while uh, working and even getting access to asylum seekers, because there's a broad discretion for uh, uh, officials to register NGOs, so to give them permission to work or not. Uh, and uh, if they do not give permission, it's very difficult to uh, NGOs to know why and also to contest this decision. And it has far-reaching uh, 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 consequences because they may not be allowed to work on the Greek territory anymore, but also not having access to the camps. Uh, and those camps are, are more... Uh, uh, um, are getting more closed and closed and controlled. So it makes it really difficult to also have an informal access to the asylum seekers. So it really fits into together to, to isolate asylum seekers and places where human rights violations take place. And on the other hand, to to uh, to affect NGOs in, in doing their work properly. And I can imagine, of course, it has a chilling effect because with those rules, you know that once you are critical, uh, you will be faced more easily with uh, with those restrictions. And, and I think this is there also the rule of law issue uh, comes in, of course, eh? because you need uh, checks and balances in a society. You need to have free speech, freedom of criticizing policies. And, and this is really uh, at stake. And um, also, you see, you, you saw the increase, but I, I also know in Italy, for instance, that if governments then start to talk about uh, prosecuting and, uh, you know, that they are doing criminal investigation towards NGOs, but at the same time, they do not really undertake uh, an, an action. Uh, these cases are pending for a long time and it, it really uh, uh, affects the reputation of NGOs at stake. Uh, although there's no evidence at all about, for instance, um, involvement in smuggling or whatever, but it already has the impact that they can do their work uh, more and that they have more difficulties in doing their work. The restrictions are being legitimated at the, this in this way um, and uh, it's all not based on evidence because there is no criminal procedure, so there is no judgment in the end. Uh, and I think this is uh, something that the Commission should be also more vigilant on. And there, if I come at the EU level, uh, there, of course, it's, uh, you see that the Commission uh, tries to uh, has made an attempt in a new pact to uh, to protect uh, uh, um, uh, humanitarian organizations more by coming up with a guidance on the facilitation directive um, where member states are uh, are encouraged uh, not to um, uh, to use the optional clause to exclude humanitarian organizations uh, from uh, uh, from the uh, the uh, from prosecution for um, uh, for uh, uh, facilitating a regular entrance. But of course, this is too weak in order to have sufficient effect. Uh, we uh, advocated for, uh, for an amendment for really uh, removing this optional uh, uh, clause to, to make them, uh, so no, no, sorry, to make the optional clause obligatory. Uh, but we didn't succeed in, in getting that. So it really now depends on, um, on how member states are sensitive for this guidance from the Commission. Um, and I think it would be important to uh, keep on linking what we see with human rights organizations to rule of law debate. Of course, we see a lot of deficiencies in the rule of law enforcement as well. It's not that easy and, and, and straightforward, but we have new uh, instruments like the conditionality mechanism. And I think the EU funding for uh, uh, um, on asylum and migration, for instance, should really be a basis for assessing to what extent human rights defenders are being protected and, and, and able to, to do their uh, monitoring uh, uh, work. Now, if I may something more say more general on monitoring and investigation, because you talk about an enabling environment for human rights protection, uh, then, of course, effective monitoring is uh, at stake, but also guarantees for independent and thorough investigation by the governments. It was already mentioned, of course, in the previous panel. But what we, can we do at the EU level on that? Because to a large extent, it's still in the hands of the national uh, uh, legislation. 
I, I think the EU level could do more uh, with safeguards for what's happening, uh, uh, you know, for the responses from the member states to human rights allegations and also to what Frontex, what Frontex is doing and allegations of uh, complicity. Uh, and I think at the moment we're really facing with a deadlock in that, where you see that there's an overwhelming round of reports from NGOs, from international organizations and ombudsmen on human rights violations. Uh, but the commission tends to say, although this is the only institute that can enforce compliance, look, uh, we have to rely on the uh, answers of the governments. And we know that, uh, you know, despite the convincing and consisting uh, reports, the governments tend to simply deny and not undertake an investigation. Uh, and I think in such a situation, you cannot uh, stop there. You need to do more as a guardian of the treaty. Uh, and I think on the one hand, you should make sure, uh, you know, come up with more demands or make sure that there is a thorough and independent investigation done by the governments on the one hand. And on the other hand, uh, otherwise doing investigations yourself. I mean, uh, uh, you know, uh, enforcement uh, compliance with the rules is not only about what is in the legislation, but also on what is happening in practice. And I understand it's very difficult to do a fact-finding investigation for the commission, but uh, this, this silence is very dissatisfactory and, and, and more should be uh, done. And maybe all organizations are, and also ombudsmen, could start using the complaint mechanism with the commission more vigorously, because once you submit complaints, it forces, it puts more pressure on the commission to look if they need to do infringement procedures. Uh, so maybe that could be uh, helpful. Of course, I think there was also the discussion on do we need more clear criteria uh, on what is an independent monitoring and resources and so on. I, I definitely agree with that. At the moment, of course, we have the Schengen Border Code, which uh, uh, obliges member states to act in, in, in accordance with the fundamental rights. And uh, this is being monitored with the CHIFAL mechanism, the, the evaluation and monitoring mechanism. Today, it's on the agenda of the Commission that uh, new proposals will be uh, filed on that. Uh, and, and what we know, of course, is that there's a large agreement that fundamental rights uh, will be an integral part of this exercise. And maybe from there, and that national monitoring bodies, I think it's important that we get that inserted as well, that uh, the position and the reports of national monitoring bodies are taken into account in this exercise. And maybe that would already imply certain criteria on those uh, monitoring bodies, that they have a sufficient mandate that they are independent and have sufficient resources. And maybe the commission could come with guidelines on that in order to ensure that we have a proper information uh, from the ground on, on how member states uh, comply with uh, Article 4 of the Schengen Border Code. Uh, of course, we have this new pact uh, where we see that uh, I think uh, everyone here in the panel knows that it's very limited in the scope the monitor mechanism too limited. So I think it's important to have proper amendments there in the screening regulation to make sure that the scope will be extended to all parts of the border and that we will have a definition of independence there and that we have a criteria for uh, um, not only for sufficient resources and mandate of the monitoring bodies, but also for independent uh, follow-up by the member states, because this is also lacking at the moment uh, concretely uh, in the screening regulation. And I think it's so important because then the commission really has a stick, has a basis to start actions towards uh, the member states. Um, yeah, I, and, and, and just uh, about Frontex, we are now of course, uh, doing the inquiry. And, and I think it's it's very important that we look into the way Frontex uh, is uh, safeguarding that the member states are respecting the human rights, but also that they do it themselves. So um, uh, we are looking into the internal mechanisms to see if, um, uh, if they have a proactive stance and if they really uh, look seriously into all signals that they uh, that 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 uh, that they find 
on uh, um, um, on uh, on allegations by the members uh, 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 by uh, on allegations of human rights violations by the member states. Uh, because I think if you look at Article 46, for instance, they need to withdraw at the moment the hosting member states uh, is persistently uh, 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 violating the human rights. That already implies that they need to do a very serious investigation on everything that uh, that uh, they can find in order to know what to do. And my last remark is, uh, I think we also need to, uh, apart from making sure that the FRO and the, the monitors of Frontex uh, will get sufficient access and are sufficiently independent and resourced. We also need to think, shouldn't we also think of joining forces on the one hand with monitoring member states compliance and monitoring Frontex compliance? Because the more uh, um, they work closely together and the more we admit uh, uh, the need for proper monitoring, the less sense it makes to have two only separate uh, mechanisms. And for Frontex, well, we are now only dealing with internal mechanisms. So it may be an idea to think about an, uh, one integrated external uh, mechanism for uh, human rights uh, at the border. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, you've mentioned so many very important points. The, the You started with with the anti-migration rhetoric, which was mentioned by Birgit before, but also the chilling effects. And thank you for making this important link to the rule of law debate. Um, I'd To the freedom of expression, I'd also add hate speech, which is also something that human rights defenders are facing uh, alongside migrants themselves. Um, but you've mentioned cases regarding NGOs. Um, and thank you for pointing towards what you think the EU can do more, especially the European Commission, but also what NHRIs and ombuds institutions could do. One thing I would just like to very slightly reflect on is the point on independence of independent monitoring. That is a, a huge issue, as we know, um, all NHRIs in our work are quite aware that independence is key. And we have been also advocating for standards for uh, NHRIs for, for years now for many issues. Uh, the, the very recent development that could be mentioned is the new uh, um, Committee of Ministers recommendation to strengthen national human rights institutions coming from the Council of Europe. Of course, we still have the Paris principles, but also the multi-mandate institutions have various standards of independence and we do know what independence means. So that knowledge that we all have from the existing mechanisms and bodies should be used in defining what independence is in terms of the independent border monitoring uh, mechanisms. Thank you very much for that. And now- May, I'm, may, may I say one, one thing? I didn't yes, mean there's, there's no definition, but I think it's important to um, anchor this definition in the screening regulations, for instance, so that there's no different interpretation about, you know, uh, uh, if some what is independence. But in, indeed, I think uh, we should have a common definition there. So thank you for adding. And thank, thank you for that comment. Now, I would like to give the floor to, to uh, Nils Muzniak, the Europe, Europe Regional Director at Amnesty International. Now, Nils, um, Amnesty International has been quite vocal about the practices that target and criminalize solidarity towards migrants throughout Europe. Um, what is Amnesty's experience in advocating against such actions? And particularly, how do you see uh, the role of NHRIs in this? And... Finally, um, what do you think are the potential risks in relation to ensuring an enabling space for the work of human rights defenders? Now, Nils, you have 10 minutes and I give you the floor. Well, thank you so much. Uh, it's great to be among so many friends and colleagues again. Uh, and I think if we're honest, we have to admit that we're quite a long way from having an enabling environment for NHRIs, let alone human rights defenders uh, working uh, at the borders. Um, and a few trends suggest that this goal might be becoming even more distant. Um, while NHRIs and, and other human rights defenders often make common cause, uh, this is not always the case. Uh, and the differences in status mean that uh, NHRIs are not generally or not as frequently subject uh, to the smear campaigns, police intimidation, administrative abuses, uh, such as seized equipment and and and, and 
criminal investigations, uh, NGOs uh, are far more vulnerable uh, to such t tactics. And sometimes uh, we need the support and help of NHRIs uh, to continue doing our work. Um, thus, Croatia, France, Greece, Italy, Hungary, and Malta um, have all attempted to defame and delegitimize the work of volunteers, activists, and organizations uh, working on migrants' rights, often by accusing them of facilitating uh, illegal migration and linking their activities with smuggling. Um, other tactics include routine identity checks, impounding vessels, um, refusing disembarkation, and so on. Uh, some states don't have NHRIs, uh, which means that the burden falls primarily on NGOs. Uh, thus, Italy has a, has a really good national preventive mechanism, but it doesn't have an NHRI. Uh, Malta doesn't have an NHRI, which works on migration. Uh, Greece has a good NHRI, but uh, they, themselves, they themselves have said that they lack a strong mandate uh, to look into pushbacks. Croatia's ombudsman, I think, Tina, you know this better than anybody, has a full mandate, but it has been denied access on a number of occasions uh, to relevant sites and, and documents. Um, so I think the challenge, uh, as, as tough as it's been already, I think it's set to grow um, in, in the coming in the coming years for a number of reasons. Uh, one, because Frontex is expanding rapidly, um, as are the human rights risks linked to its activity. Uh, and the issue of accountability uh, remains really problematic. Um, the internal accountability mechanisms have so far proven pretty ineffective uh, and the EU ombudsman alone will not be able to fulfill the task, uh, especially of this huge and, and growing agency. Um, the securitization of border management is entrenched, and it's now being bolstered by increasing use of, of tech. Uh, it's been mentioned in, uh, before today, but let me quote from an article in this week's AP News, which I found quite striking. Uh, the, the EU has poured 3 billion euros into security tech research uh, following the refugee crisis in 2015 and 2016. 3 billion euros. An automated surveillance network is being built on the Greek-Turkish border, uh, that aims to detect migrants early and deter them from crossing with river and land patrols using searchlights and long range acoustic devices. And finally, artificial intelligence powered lie detectors and virtual border guard interview bots have been piloted as well as efforts to integrate satellite data with footage from drones on land, air, sea and underwater. Palm scanners record the unique vein pattern in a person's hand to use as a biometric identifier, and the makers of live camera reconstruction technology promise to erase foliage virtually, exposing people hiding near border areas. So in other words, tech uh, is being invested in big time, uh, and some tech, especially artificial intelligence-driven tech, we know holds grave risks for human rights and discrimination, if, especially if the algorithms are uh, uh, have embedded in them uh, human biases. Um, and uh, we poor NGOs have to become much more tech savvy if we're going to monitor uh, human rights effectively at the border, because uh, there is an arms race going on and we're not even part of it. Uh, and it's getting to be very, very high tech. Um, Another challenge is that the violations have been mass in scale and impunity is entrenched for perpetrators. Uh, how many border guards, coast guards, or Frontex personnel have been prosecuted uh, for perpetrating violence or other abuses at the borders? I think that the numbers uh, are quite minimal, um, probably on, on, on the fingers of two hands. We can count the number of people who have actually been held accountable. Uh, now, this highlights a need for better cooperation between NHRIs, NGOs, and prosecutors. Um, now, this impunity is uh, reinforced by the perpetrators hiding their tracks uh, and the unwillingness of victims to step forward. Um, perpetrators often lack identifying uniforms uh, or numbers, and they often wear masks. Um, they make it very difficult for victims to report uh, by destroying phones uh, and other personal items. Uh, since March of 2020, Greek prosecutors have started charging asylum seekers uh, for irregular entry uh, with very severe sanctions. Um, those migrants who do step forward want very often want anonymity, which is a huge obstacle when accessing remedies. Um, those uh, migrants who have been pulled back to Libya uh, often have no remedy because they're arbitrarily 
detained um, uh, and and uh, many of them disappear. Um, so one idea would be to give victims uh, recognition and special protection, uh, including residency permits, uh, similar, similarly to victims of trafficking or, or domestic violence in the context of the Istanbul Convention. Convention. So if you want people to step forward, uh, you better offer them something in return. Otherwise, they're risking a lot. And these are among the most vulnerable people on the planet. Uh, now, the lack of accountability at borders is complicated by the involvement of third party, third parties. Uh, in the case of the EU, it's most often Turkey, Turkey uh, Libya, and Morocco. Uh, so the jurisdictional scope of border monitoring usually doesn't include these third countries. Uh, which often do the EU's dirty work by pulling back migrants, uh, disembarking them, or, or taking them quickly back in uh, in exchange for benefits uh, we rarely read about in the media. Now, NHRIs should include due diligence on cooperation with these third countries in their monitoring. Uh, any border monitoring mechanism should as well. Now, Amnesty has documented uh, the criminalization of solidarity in a large uh, regional report last year, and in a recent submission to the UN Special Rapporteur on Migration. Um, we've also documented pushbacks on the externalization um, uh, of migration control in reports last year on Croatia, Italy, and Malta. Uh, and we have a report forthcoming on pushbacks in Greece. Uh, and we're about to publish a new 20-step uh, plan of action on the central Mediterranean and a new briefing on the situation um, of migrants pulled back uh, to Libya. Uh, so the record is is quite clear and damning, uh, as is the impunity. So we're we're very much in support of the creation of an independent uh, border monitoring mechanisms uh, that are well resourced uh, with intrusive powers uh, and a mandate to ensure accountability. Uh, this is going to be a tough, tough battle, and the states are going to fight against it. Um, and just to end on, on, on a broader note about the rule of law, uh, I think thus far the EU and its member states have treated the dismantling of judicial independence in Poland and Hungary uh, as rule of law crises. Um, but however, uh, the EU's rule of law lens has been completely blind uh, to the mass violations and lack of accountability at the borders. Uh, and you have to ask yourself, why is this? Is this because the victims are not EU citizens? Is this because violence and impunity are seen as uh, contributing to the deterrence of migration uh, and that's seen as an acceptable price to pay? Uh, or is it because combating these violations and this impunity will not win anybody any elections? Um, in any case, uh, it's striking that the 27 member state 27 member states in the, in the richest region of the world can't manage their border fairly, responsibly, uh, and in full compliance with international law. Uh, this leads one to ask what we can expect of other governments and regions. Um, how, how credible a voice can the EU be in this realm uh, when it tries to spread the human rights message around the world? I'll stop there. Thanks. Thank you so much, Niels. Uh, um, as always, you've covered quite a lot, especially uh, uh, teasing out some really worrying trends. Uh, um, and I won't repeat what you've said, uh, but interestingly enough, I think you picked up uh, uh, incredibly well on the future regarding the use of new technologies and AI and what human rights defenders, both NHRIs as well as uh, um, NGOs will be doing to be able to question what is really happening without the, the technical knowledge and expertise and whether some sort of new alliances uh, uh, will need to be forged in this respect. Um, thank you for also touching upon the, the link with the rule of law and of course the independent uh, border monitoring mechanism. I'll stop there. I'm sure there will be many questions. So now, last but not least, uh, I would like to hear from Inma Vasquez, the representative to the EU and NATO at uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, Doctors Without Borders, so we can get some insight on how MSF has observed and dealt with human rights defenders, um, including yourselves. So facing obstructions and harassment uh, uh, in, in your operations and how has the lack of this in enabling environment, as we call it, uh, impacted on your ability to carry out uh, uh, your work? Um, how have you tried to challenge the trend? And do you have any recommendations for others 
for NHRIs as well as uh, uh, for for other actors, uh, civil society actors and organizations uh, in terms of further action. Um, please go ahead and you have 10 minutes. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for, for inviting us to this discussion. We are not normally uh, in the circuit of uh, human rights defenders, uh, uh, but uh, the more and more <laughs> because of our uh, humanitarian work in migration, we, we, we are not only exposed, but we are uh, trying to explore and, and the ways to better collaborate uh, with you, especially to know how our, our information and our data can be useful to you and how your work can help us to, um, to help our patients that we call it, eh? because we always talk about, as a medical orga uh, humanitarian organization, we talk about patients. Eh? Um, and indeed, this is, a, this, is a, this is a typical dilemma. I will start with this, but then I will go. A typical dilemma in the humanitarian work is to say, okay, we, we, our entry point is to do a medical program. The medical program is to alleviate the suffering uh, when a, a person is in one of these situations to mitigate eh, and, and also to, to protect the life of the person. Eh? But then the, the example that we always put, when you are doing mental health care in a camp uh, in, uh, in Greece or in a detention center in, um, in, in Libya, uh, uh, and you know that the, the, the cause that is aggravating the problem of the mental health situation or causing it directly of your patient is, is, is precisely the detention of the entrapment, the situation, the abuse, etc. You need to see what you can do to really help this person because it's not just the uh, some medicines that you can give for the mental health situation. That, uh, so that's, that's the dilemma. And sometimes you say, well, we have to put limits to our humanitarian work considering um, the protection of the people beyond our medical work. Eh? So that's very important for us. So now, in, in Europe, we have been confronted to this uh, situation as, as the human rights defenders, which we were not used to eh, in, in, in Europe. Um, uh, and then um, I, I think I will use mostly, I will use some of, of the examples also in Greece, as Tineke was mentioning, but I will focus on the search and rescue because I think it illustrates very well the situation, because there, there, there is, there are different perspectives. So first of all, is that the what is happening is just uh, with different means it obstructs the work, meaning that when we are not at sea or we are at sea with very limited capacity, we are just back now. So and this is, yeah, causing the deaths of the people because at the same time. Europe has decided not to put search and rescue capacity and seed or to delegate it to the to the Libyan Coast Guard. So uh, this is very important because this is um, yeah I mean this is not um, uh, the, the criminalization of one member state or it, this is not the narrative that is uh, putting the pressure, but it's a, a, a well thought and thought collective decision of European governments and European institutions. So here they are all, eh, this is really well planned and organized to uh, obstruct uh, independent search and rescue at sea so that people don't enter. That's very well planned. Uh, so that's one thing. So then we have faced several aspects. So one is uh, the, the narrative as, as you all, eh? so this is new for us. But again, we I want to put the accent not just on the pressure on, on social media and, and individuals and civil society, but also on the pressure of the official mainstream institutional <laughs> narrative that creates the suspicion because this started officially. So initially uh, we started in 2015 our search and rescue activities with other organizations and this was very much welcome. Oh yes, this is good, fantastic. No? All of a sudden, the, the, it, Starts coming up. Uh, well, first the fake, the fake news, but then in, in real, in, in uh, institutional language, that mm, this activity yes is humanitarian, but uh, is is helping is helping uh, smugglers is is facilitating the work of smugglers. And then we go a step further and say, well, no, you are your activity of search and rescue is an obstacle for us in the fight against trafficking. And this is official institutional narrative of the of the institutions. I mean, the, the, the European Commission, the leaders, etc., and the governments, of course. And the, the, with the parliament, 
with the with the exceptions of of, of of some groups and individuals that we know very well, but uh, still, eh? or, or uh, even less so in the parliament for sure. Uh, but um, uh, so this is this is there. Eh? Um, this is one thing. Then the cases, the cases. So uh, I wanted to show, well, maybe it will confuse. I wanted to show the map. Uh, the Fundamental Rights Agency is making. Uh, every year, uh, they they do a, a map of of the cases of search and rescue, eh? and it's, it's it's very good to see. But I will lose time showing you the screen. But um, so there have been fifty proceedings. I mean, the last update they they count fifty proceedings in total against NGOs, uh, and and this and what they map and you see all the red is is the boats that are not at sea. So this is the important. It's not what happens in the end if the criminal charges are confirmed or not, which is not the case. None of them have been confirmed by, by, by a tribunal, but the boats are stopped. They are not at sea. Okay? So that's that is what I want to insist on. <laughs> um, and then, so there is the, so the criminal charges has been a, a very a cumbersome. I mean, it's a still the case. They are still open. Some of them in, in there is the, the case, um, of uh, Trapani, in which MSF is involved, and also Save the Chilean and other organizations, in which there are still uh, there is going to be a judgment, and there is a, the, well we have uh, as MSF four people with criminal charges, uh, and this is uh, uh, charges for uh, facilitating trafficking. Eh? Um, um, there are thirty thousand pages in this dossier. Eh, of the investigation. And of course, all type recording and all these kind of things. Well, uh, that's one thing. And then we have, we are still facing another case of, of um, uh, illicit uh, trafficking of, of waste, which is, uh, this is in Catania. And this, the judgment is going to take place in November. So, the, I mean, these are things that are just incredible, you know, unbelievable. So, but the, the, and the reality, so the, we don't think this will end up in a criminal charge against MSF staff, but meanwhile, the votes are stopped, or we have to restart another vote, or we have to, uh, you know, uh, all the negotiations, it takes months to negotiate to have a new vessel. Eh? So this is one thing. And then there is also the use, oh my God, this is the use, the use of the administrative detention. Eh? Uh, of the votes. So this is administrative obstacle. So they use excuses related to the safety of navigation in order to stop the votes. So I, 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 I go very quickly and say what can be done. So the first that, uh, that uh, if we think about collaboration with you is to recognize that there is a problem. Eh? And, and still, the official narrative of the European Commission is to say there is no case for criminalization because no the, because the cases are not confirmed. And then the response is this guidance uh, that uh, Tineke was referring to, uh, that was uh, is a proposal in the migration path. And the problem is not just only that it's guidance. I will go a, a bit further, uh, Tineke, is that the content is meaningless. It means nothing. It says saving lives is not a crime. Of course, it's not a crime. It's an international obligation. So, so they don't say anything. So that's is not uh, for us. It's not satisfactory at all. But beyond that, there is in the same migration path there is another proposal of the Commission to create uh, is a coordination group uh, for, within the member states for safety of navigation that indeed is counterproductive because this is it is feeding the arguments that the European governments are using to, uh, to, to, to stop the vessels because they consider that our vessels are, are a safety uh, for navigation. So we are putting at risk the migrants and, 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 and refugees. I mean, it's, it's just nonsense. It's, it's, it's nonsense because if, I don't know if you have seen the vessels, the, the way we have sophisticated the money that it costs, the, the, the search and rescue we have now is is really really I mean there is absolutely it's impeccable <laughs> how we do it uh, and 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 one thing uh, because you were saying what the commission can do what they could do apart of all the things that you have already said for example is funding search and rescue activity we are doing this with our own resources MSF we are privileged we have a lot of resources uh, because the people uh, the European and, and uh, worldwide people are are, are contributing. But, uh, but other organizations, they are struggling and they do it with very basic, fund it, this humanitarian work, you fund humanitarian work everywhere in the world. 
this is humanitarian work. Ah, no, 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 this is not humanitarian. Ah, but then you are already biasing the narrative. Well, <laughs> I think I have already overpassed. I, I have some more uh, comments on, on how to collaborate, what we could do, but I'm sure it will come in the questions and answers. Sorry that I extend. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, Inma. Um, and I want to thank you for such an interesting panel. Uh, I now want to close the second panel and give the floor to Gabriel Almeida, the Human Rights Officer at NRE, to conclude this first day of this high-level conference. And thank you again to your panelists, as well as all the participants. <laughs>